All right, folks, we're at, uh, we're at about 10 o'clock, so we're going to get started to respect everybody's time and make sure we have plenty of time for our speaker today. It's my pleasure to introduce Caitlin Pike. Um, Caitlin and I met a few years ago at an ISA conference uh, when she was a student, a, a master's student at DePaul University. And this is uh, the presentation today will actually be part of her master's project. And Caitlin is joining us from Vancouver, BC. So she's, it's earlier for her. So we appreciate her taking the time to get up a little bit earlier today to present to us where uh, Caitlin is now a PhD student at the University of British Columbia in their forestry department. Um, so thank you very much and welcome everybody on the call. And Caitlin, uh, please go ahead. You can share your screen. And- Sounds good. Um, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep, that looks good. Okay, sounds good. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Um, as Eric said, I am Caitlin Pike. I am currently a PhD student at the University of British Columbia. And today we'll be talking about tree preservation during residential construction. Um, as Eric said, this was the focus of my master's research at DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois, where I lived for sev several years. Um, this project began as a smaller evaluation for a suburb north of Chicago, where I was hired as a research assistant to see how trees were doing on properties after construction occurred. Um, because I was just beginning my master's program at the time, it made sense to kind of turn this into my thesis, um, especially because when I was looking into the literature, there weren't a lot of studies of this kind yet that looked at, at trees on residential properties um, who had been protected with a tree preservation ordinance. So before I begin, um, of course, I just want to take some time quick to acknowledge the support and funding that helped make this research possible. It was definitely a collaborative effort. As you can see, um, I had my two advisors. One was from DePaul University, you may be familiar with, Jess Boat. Um, the other, Keith O'Haran, he's, um, he was, so he has his doctorate, but he also is the city forester of Highland Park, which is where the study took place. Um, I was also, had some funding from the Morton Arboretum, <laughs> Morton Arboretum um, the Garden Club of America Tree Fund, um, and then as well as support, of course, from Highland Park, um, being able to work in that city kind of allowed me, um, you know, access to city permit data, um, tree preservation plans, and kind of gave me a little bit more authority um, when I was conducting research, um, especially because I was entering private properties. Um, so in this presentation, I plan to take some time um, just kind of going over the literature on urban trees, their benefits, their threats, how ordinances are used to protect city trees, the importance of the root system, and how tree condition is measured. Next, I will introduce the city where this study took place, followed by the methods I used to evaluate their preservation ordinance. And finally, I will present my, resu my results and how I interpreted them when making recommendations for the city. So um, the aim of this research, as I kind of alluded to, was to better understand the role of municipal forestry ordinances in tree preservation during residential construction. So in other words, the city wanted to know whether it was successfully protecting residential trees during construction projects and whether those trees were still, you know, still alive and well um, several years after these projects occurred. So first for a little bit of background, just to get us all oriented um, in the United States, urban forests represent 35% of all urban land cover. They deliver benefits to two thirds of the population and they provide significant ecosystem services that produce over $18 billion um, dollars, US dollars in net annual benefits. However, rising urban population and development threatens the diversity and extent of urban trees, which not only lowers ecosystem service benefits, but can actually cause ecosystem disservices such as damage to human health and property. Um, on the left here, you can see a photo of Chicago skyline that includes its urban tree canopy cover. 
So in order to protect um, the, tree, the trees, uh, urban trees on residential properties and private properties, um, in the United States, tree ordinances are enacted. They are local laws um, enacted by local government that protect and manage a community's trees. This includes tree planting, removal, maintenance, um, as, as well as a few other things, of course. Um, these are the kind of like the main things. 90% of the communities in the US have some sort of tree ordinance, though most regulate public trees. It is less common to regulate private trees on private property. For this reason, gaps exist in the knowledge and power that municipalities have regarding trees on these properties. And this is significant because US cities are on average made up of 40% residential land. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that goes on on pr uh, private properties, especially residential prop properties that, you know, the municipality can't really control um, for better or for worse, but um, it is it is what it is. Um, on the other hand, tree preservation ordinances are tools that establish standards for tree preservation and, and guide homeowners and developers during construction projects. More and more communities in the US are introducing some sort of tree preservation ordinance, particularly in an effort to save mature trees, which are the most valuable in terms of their ecosystem services. Little is known, however, about the efficacy of these types of ordinances. Tree preservation itself is a specialized field that includes input from several different actors. These actors rely on best management practices and agree upon national standards of how to protect trees during construction. The American National Standards Institute, which standardizes safety protocols surrounding tree care and management, found that the most common tree injuries during construction are root severance, soil compaction, and trunk damage. And as we know, um, roots require water, air, nutrients, and space to thrive. They're generally found in the upper 12 to 18 inches of the soil. Um, practitioners have defined the root area most important to tree health and survival as the critical root zone. However, there is no universal standard for measuring the critical root zone, but a common metric used by municipalities in the US is one foot for every one inch in diameter should be protected. So as seen on the, in the photo on the left, a 20 inch diameter tree should have, or would have a critical root zone of 20 feet and tree protection zones aim to protect as much of this critical root zone as possible. However, as you can imagine, or as you might experience um, in your own life when working with trees, maybe on, on properties undergoing construction, um, this isn't always possible um, just because of the layout, um, you know, especially in dense locations. Um, so a lot of the times, you know, this, this root zone can get encroached upon. And so a big component of this, of course, is understanding tree condition. Um, and tree condition, at least as we view it, it's a metric for tree health. It's most commonly estimated based on the crown and the trunk. Um, there's a ton of different ways to measure tree condition. Um, you can, you know, I mean, there's a ton of different ways, as you see, as you all know, um, a lot of them measure value. Um, they can measure risk of failure. Tree inventories um, are used in U.S. cities. 90% um, of cities in the U.S. use inventories as a part of their management plans. And this helps cities better understand the health of their forest. There are also more complex ways of measuring condition um, because a lot of the tree inventories, they kind of use like a categorical um, value. So, you know, zero being like dead, one being poor, two being fair, three being good. Um, you know, it kind of depends on the on the city, how they like to measure that, because um, one could be standing dead as well. Um, or they might use a percentage out of 100. Um, but there are also, as I was saying, um, condition indices that are more complex. Um, they're more complex ways of measuring condition. These allow the transformation of kind of qualitative observations 
such as kind of good fair poor, and they turn them into quantitative data, such as, you know, kind of using indicators to create these numbers. Um, and this helps to decrease subjectivity. So you're not really just looking at a tree and be like, oh, it looks good. Um, but you can kind of use all these different indicators to kind of come up with something that means something more. And that's something I, I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but on the left here, I just kind of like this graphic, um, but it's a demonstration of how trees are sometimes able to kind of like bounce back from decline. But once you go past a threshold, um, they they might not be able to bounce back. So this of course is something we're familiar with, but I always liked uh, this graphic and I think it's, I forget what paper that's from. So um, before beginning my research, I conducted a review of the literature um, in order to explore what the impacts of construction are on trees when no preservation plan is in place. So there were a few different studies and I've kind of synthesized them a bit here. Um, but in general, studies found that construction can lead to tree loss and a decline in canopy cover. Studies also found that a tree's proximity to redevelopment can lead to death, particularly for trees that were larger in diameter or already were in poor condition or had less root space. Root severance and soil compaction were also prominent in the literature as challenges that often occur during construction projects. And finally, species have been found to differ in their tolerance to construction disturbance. So as is best practice, I used this literature um, and considered all these different factors um, when developing the methods for my research, um, both the, the slides I showed you earlier with the critical root zone, um, with understanding condition of trees, and then just kind of what the existing literature was saying about how trees are reacting to construction. So my question then was, even though the literature suggests that construction is just bad news for trees, can a tree preservation ordinance successfully protect trees during construction? All right, so, um, so given all that, um, I will now tell you a little bit about this, the place where this study took place. Um, this study took place in the city of Highland Park, Illinois. Um, it's an affluent suburban city, um, just 25 miles north of Chicago in the Midwestern United States. It's a city of 30,000 residents and nearly 50% canopy cover. Highland Park employs a city forester who it's had, um, it's had since 1967. Um, if I recall correctly, um, this was actually directly related to um, Dutch elm disease in response to Dutch elm disease, um, because in the, started in the 50s, they were started losing, losing a lot of elms due to Dutch elm disease. So that was when they kind of first started passing ordinances. And then the city forester came into the picture in 1967 to continue to kind of um, reinforce some of these ordinances that they were enacting. Um, so yeah, and then they also have an assistant city forester and a forestry intern that's more of like a temporary kind of seasonal job. And they have a combined task of managing 30,000 public trees, but they also respond to like um, residential calls as well. And of course, um, handle tree preservation, um, like kind of dockets and, and um, projects. So, um, and as I mentioned before, because of the city forester's background in academia, which included the doctorate degree in forestry, he actually created my temporary position as a researcher um, with some of the extra available funding. So um, that kind of like created my job and um, that allowed me to kind of help like start evaluating some of the, pro the programs um, that they were doing in Highland Park. My first project I actually did before starting this, um, I helped to evaluate the street trees, uh, newly planted street trees that were planted from uh, contractors, hired contractors. And, and so the city wanted to see how these trees were doing, the condition that they were planted in, how they were doing years later, you know, were the contractors kind of following the rules that were in the contract about you know, removing certain parts of like twine and burlap and, and part of the uh, wire basket and, and just little things like that. So um, that was one of my first 
projects working with the city and and definitely kind of allowed me both um, to learn like more on the ground skills, but also like the kind of the flexibility of imagining it like a research project. Um, so it was, it was a really neat experience. And um, I did want to mention, of course, too, that it's really important to note that Highland Park has an above average budget in terms of forestry departments. Um, it hovers around a million dollars annually. And looking into this, I found that this is actually three times the national um, average for forestry departments of similar population sizes. So that's definitely something to take uh, into account. This is a city that has a very well-funded, robust forestry department. Um, so, um, and then on the right here is just a, a really nice shot, aerial shot of the city. And then before I, I go on further, I wanted to list some fun facts about Highland Park. Um, it's actually been kind of the location for a lot of different movies. Um, this is the, this is the, the house that was in actually Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, this is the home from like, if you've seen the movie, it's a famous scene where, where Cameron accidentally drives his, his dad's Ferrari off into the ravine. So um, I thought that was like, I, I would always drive by that that house and just thought it was awesome because, you know, this kind of John Hughes movies um, that I grew up with as a youngster, it, it was cool to see. Um, they also film like Weird Science, 16 Candles, um, Risky Business, and Home Alone um, in the city and then around the city as well. I think in another city over was um, Breakfast Club um, was in another uh, city over. So it's also been the home of celebrities such as Michael Jordan, uh, Mr. T, and the lead singer of the Smashing Pumpkins. Um, and in addition to that, um, it's had some famous architects and landscape architects who have either lived there or built homes there. Um, I forget who built this home in particular, but uh, landscape architect Jens Jensen lived there um, in Highland Park. and. There's also a building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in Highland Park as well. So just kind of some interesting uh, tidbits. So, so um, moving on from that, again, going back to this municipal code, over the years, Highland Park has passed several tree preservation ordinances that are considered kind of models for tree protection on public and private properties. These ordinances classify all trees over eight inches in diameter as protected key or heritage trees based on species and size. And even on private property, none of these classified trees may be removed without approval from the city council as well as a neighborhood tree council. And trees with heritage status are the most protected species and, they, and receiving a permit for their removal is incredibly difficult. Anytime a developer wants to construct or redevelop a building in Highland Park, they must receive a building permit. To receive approval, developers must hire a certified arborist to conduct a pre-construction inventory and create a tree preservation plan that indicates where each tree is on the site, as well as the respective tree protection zones around each tree or group of trees. And then here's an example of how trees are classified by the city. So as I mentioned, all trees over eight inches in diameter, um, except buckthorn and willow are classified at least as key species. Um, so this means that a permit is needed, as I said, for the removal at any point, even if it's not during a construction project. Um, if they are removed, they must be replaced with two trees. And if they're removed unlawfully, they, there will be a fine issued for every tree removed. Um, and then as you see, classification status increases with, with size, um, but also with species. So all of these species, regardless um, of their size, I think though they have to be eight inches, but um, from then on up, they're all protected. And then again, three, three trees must be planted for every one removal. Um, and then for heritage, these are our big like oaks, elms, hickory, walnut, um, the mature species. So once they get a little bit larger, permit, like I said, is pretty much unlikely to happen um, unless it's like, unless there's a lot of risk and it's it's nearly dead or something like that. But again, it still needs to go through the council and then it would still need to be replaced by four trees. And if 
And if it was removed unlawfully, which um, you know it, it does happen, um, they will find them um, for as much as that they can, but $4,000 per tree. And I, well, actually that's on the next slide. I was gonna say, um, so violations do happen. Um, that was actually something that was really interesting to me working with the city. It was kind of able to see the back behind the scenes stuff. So um, I was able to go to like, um, they had a different, what is it called? It was kind of like the city council and there was like a judge, but it wasn't, I can't remember the name of it, but basically they, they would bring in developers or homeowners who kind of just cut out swaths of uh, trees, especially if they were right near like um, the lake, Lake Michigan and would kind of just like cut down a bunch of trees instead of asking for permission, kind of, you know, felt like, well, it's better to ask for forgiveness type thing. Um, but that was definitely a lot of, um, it was really interesting to see. Um, but but anyways, so the, the building permit violations do occur. So even after permits are approved, the assistant city forester periodically checks each site for compliance. Um, and here are some pictures that he took of violations to city code involving the protection of trees during construction. So not just cutting down a tree, but even just, you know, um, placing heavy equipment on top of the critical root zone. Uh, there's not supposed to be any heavy equipment, not supposed to store any material, like improper materials, especially not only the weight, but, you know, leaking kind of different chemicals into the soil, um, removing, moving soil grade, um, piling it on top of trees, you know, the fence is like all messed up. And, um, and then here you see utility trenching, which is not allowed. Um, they, they use an alternative, which they use is boring. Um, so all of these are just examples of of different violations that occur. You know, most times things happen as they should, um, but this is just an example of why, you know, even if you have an ordinance in place, you kind of wanna, you know, follow up, make sure things are happening as they should um, for the efficacy of it. So, um, so yeah, so given all that, um, you know, kind of got a lot of that background and. Um, information in and I was ready to start kind of collecting data. So to begin my data collection, I began with a plan and permit analysis. So, you know, I, det I determined my study group. Um, I wanted to look at properties that had been completely demolished. So they had an original house on their property and they demolished the, the older home and then they redeveloped and they built a new home. And that this had to occur, occur between the years 2004 and 2015. So, um, and then, you know, ending in 2015, that would kind of give us an opportunity to kind of see um, how trees were doing, if they were impacted, if they had died since, um, et cetera. So working with the city of Highland Park's public works department, I was able to use their permit database to find the residential properties that fit this criteria. And from there, I searched these physical case files that you can see on your left for viable tree preservation plans. So at the time, all of these were hard copies. Um, so like I said, I could find in the permit database, you know, do a query, but then I had to kind of go into these uh, hard copy files and start looking at true preservation plans and, and figuring out if they're viable and I could use them um, to kind of, you know, be able to tell whether or not trees were still there and existing on the property after construction occurred. So tree preservation plans that clearly defined which trees were intended to be preserved on site were used in my study. Um, and I was also able to use these like permit numbers, the building permit numbers, as a legitimate way to kind of notify homeowners that I was interested in measuring the trees on their property and that they could opt out by contacting the forestry department. So this actually really, it worked really nicely because, um, you know, it's, it's easier, it's harder to opt out of something than it is to opt in, which a lot of times, you know, especially how research is, is uh, structured, you, you do have to have people opt in, but because this was kind of tied to the city, um, you know, I was working with the city 
of course, you know, this was completely voluntary, so they could opt out. But we actually only had um, two residents opt out out of, uh, you know, 100 and, and something properties that we included in this study. So it worked out really nicely in that regard. And, you know, the homeowners were actually really great, um, really great to, to speak with and um, were really accommodating. So, um, so yeah. And, and then this permit database was also used to verify um, control properties that had not had any recent construction occur since initially being developed. So they had that initial home that was probably built in like the 50s or like the 70s um, and then just, you know, no new construction. So it's kind of the original house. So I used that, um, I used those properties. Again, making sure that no construction had occurred. I even like got rid of properties that, you know, had like a porch, a back porch or a new driveway or, uh, something that was maybe would affect um, how the trees were doing. So I used these trees and these properties as kind of a comparison. And then here's an example of a construction site map with a tree preservation plan that I determined to be viable. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but I'll zoom in in a second. But, um, you know, the, the home here is where it's proposed to be built. Um, and there's trees approved for removal here, which are with the X marks. Um, so I was definitely looking for that because I wanted to make sure that it was clear there's trees that are being preserved, there's trees that are being removed. Um, so zooming in, you can see here um, how each tree is measured uh, for its DBH. It's given a little number. Um, and then it, this is the example of the tree preservation fence with the X's and the dashed lines. So it's clear, you know, these trees are being preserved. And some of these, some of these inventories did include, or some of these plants included the inventory, which again was a requirement. Um, they listed the species, they also listed condition, but again, it was kind of that subjective kind of condition. Um, but actually, this pre-existing kind of information wasn't always um, reserved and or it wasn't always retained. So, you know, I might find um, tree preservation plans that weren't like complete. Um, so, you know, I'm assuming that they were complete at the time of um, submitting because that is the requirement to have a permit submitted. But going back, you know, several years later, some of these would only include um, maybe like this section, um, you know, actually that was like a big issue was that these weren't all uniform. It kind of depended on the developer um, and what method they used. So um, for that reason, I wasn't able to kind of like re heavily rely on species information um, or condition. And I kind of had to mostly just rely on, okay, is the tree there? Does the DBH kind of make sense? Um, you know, that it's a large tree, it didn't all of a sudden get super small, you know. Um, and so that that allowed me to make um, make statements about tree preservation. Okay, and then here is just an example of kind of like a site plan that I might not have determined to be viable. Um, you know, it's kind of like this hand drawn afterthought a bit. Um, these, I guess, look like they are planned for removal, but I just don't really, you know, I just didn't really trust it. Um, so something like this, I wouldn't have included in the study. Um, I actually had worse, ex like worse examples or better examples of worse uh, tr tree preservation plants than this, but I, I just didn't scan them. Um, and then on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, there were a few plans like this, which, you know, obviously are landscape plans, not tree preservation plans. So while they're very, you know, beautiful and pretty to look at, they didn't provide me with any information um, on like, you know, whether a tree was being removed or like uh, preserved where the fence was. Um, so it just didn't have that level of detail that I needed. So those weren't included. So when I was finally, I had all my sites ready. I had my tree preservation plans printed out. Um, I was ready to go into the field, but of course, well, of course I came up with this inventory protocol before, but so in the field, I used uh, this inventory protocol to kind of survey the trees on the properties. So I measured each tree within a hundred feet of the house foundation um, 
and I gave it a unique number. So then I, I say to, of course, every tree within 100 feet of the house foundation that could be physically accessed by myself. Um, all trees were recorded for tree preservation uh, rate. So, you know, like seeing them with my eyes, et cetera, but um, not all trees could be physically measured just given the kind of woodsy nature of Highland Park, the ravines, as you kind of saw earlier, some trees would kind of go down in the ravine um, or were just kind of inaccessible. So other than that, all trees were surveyed. Um, and then that tree preservation plan was used uh, to rec record whether the tree, you know, was still there or whether it had been removed after construction took place. So if the tree was still there, I recorded its genus, its species, its size, um, its condition, the proximity to hardscape, and the level of soil compaction and soil moisture. So for tree condition, I used both the traditional method that the city used, such as the good, fair, poor, but I also made use of an index that included a crown and trunk assessment. And this index was um, adapted from a volunteer inventory protocol that was created by Dr. Eric North. Um, and after comparing just several different methods for objectively and realistically measuring tree health and chatting with Eric, um, I determined that this index was the perfect fit for this project. Um, I was also able to borrow some really neat tools from DePaul, including a digital hypsometer, which I used to measure the distance to from like the tree to foundation or the tree to the street. Um, and I also used a digital pentrometer and a sensor to measure soil compaction and soil moisture. So on the left here is a photo I took of um, a tree experiencing some canopy tip dieback. And this was directly above a driveway in the city of Highland Park. And so here is a quick breakdown of the index condition I used when surveying trees, um, where crown and trunk condition are based on several vari variables um, that were adapted again um, from the initial index and that I also found uh, were important for um, representing possible impacts from construction. Um, so these included crown dieback, water sprouts, decaying wood. Um, you know, these are signs, signs of construction um, kind of damage maybe like from the roots, et cetera, where you're losing a uh, crown canopy. And then this kind of like um, cambium loss and like decayed wood, like that could be a sign um, from like injury from being hit by, um, by something like uh, heavy equipment or something like that. So all these things were, were taken into account. As you can see um, for each category, there's different ways that these were weighted. And that each deduct, there were deductions made in quarter increments and they depended kind of on the severity. And this, this added up to a total of four points, um, four points of deductions for the crown and trunk and was subtracted by a total amount of eight for the index. So, so um, if the tree scored eight, it would be, you know, the perfect tree. Um, if the tree scored zero, then it, it was in pretty bad shape and then anywhere in between. So again, while I surveyed all the trees within 100 feet of the property, um, there were five species of interest that we were specifically um, interested in. These native trees were selected due to their significance within the city of Highland Park as heritage trees. Um, but they also are just really good native trees to the area. Um, oaks in particular, they're large long lived species and they bring a lot of benefits um, to the area. And then here on the left are just some pictures of, of these species um, and they are provided by the Morton Arboretum. All right, so finally we come to the results. So when accounting for every tree that was included on tree preservation site maps and intended to be preserved, the city's ordinance had an average tree preservation rate of 74%. So um, again, this preservation rate includes every single tree on the property site plan, even the ones that I could not physically reach and measure. Um, but on average, 
we found that there were about 17 trees on the properties before construction. And then there were 13 trees after construction. So that means that on average, four trees are lost after construction occurred. However, there's a big caveat to this because it's worth noting that this preservation rate actually doesn't account for uh, pest and disease such as emerald ash borer or Dutch elm disease. Um, and without verifiable species data for some of the removals, it wasn't possible to discern which trees could have been impacted by these types of issues. Um, I know there was a few years, especially with ash and elm, where they were kind of, um, you know, approving uh, removal permits and some of this data wasn't really like retained properly again. Um, so one of the ways I was thinking about getting around this, you know, pre pandemic, I was thinking like a follow up solution was that um, checking into these removal permits and just seeing like how I could adjust the preservation rate accordingly, you know, um, seeing if the removal was ash or elm, because when I was speaking with homeowners, they were, they were talking about how a lot of the trees that were removed um, might have been ash or elm. And again, it's kind of anecdotal, but um, it, you know, it's an important um, consideration. Um, I wasn't able to follow up with this kind of um, adjustment though, because the pandemic happened and I wasn't able to kind of get access to that information remotely. And then, um, you know, graduated and, and left Chicago, but it's, um, you know, regardless, we found that the city's tree preservation rate was actually pretty satisfactory, given the complexity of the data. Um, complexity of construction occurring, complexity of uh, pests and disease, the complexity of just being a tree on private property in general. And, you know, there's a lot that that impacts those trees, as we know. So, um, that being said, um, again, I physically measured and recorded um, full data on as many trees as I could physically reach. Um, and so in the end, this gave me data on 640 study trees on 102 residential properties that underwent construction, and then 140 comparison trees on 43 residential properties that had not experienced construction in the past 50 years. And so when we look at tree condition, overall trees on recent, re recently redeveloped properties shown in the gold were in worse condition than trees on properties that had not experienced recent construction um, shown in the blue. And this was true for both of our condition measurements here. So here you see traditional condition, um, again, with the best possible score of five. And then here you see uh, index condition with the best possible score of eight. Um, so statistical tests found that these differences were significant based on their p-values. Um, if you all are familiar with p-values, um, as long as it's a number, you know, you run a, st a stats test that fits the criteria, and as long as it's below 0 0.05, um, it's significant. So. And then, um, however, though, the standard deviation that we found showed that there was a lot of variability and overlap in the data. So you can see that here with these light bars. Um, both of these are like overlapping one another. So it kind of shows how similar they are. So in other words, you know, we ran these kind of fancy statistical tests, which we're supposed to do in science, but but like we found that there wasn't really that much difference between the two. You know, if you look at this more closely between the condition scores, um, they're really just separated by like a fraction of a point. So like, what does that really mean when you're looking at a tree? Um, can you can you like can you even discern that difference um, if the tree's still alive and well? Um, you know, there's a lot to be said with that, and that's why it was really. Um, it was a good learning experience as well. You know, I was like kind of a younger scientist and learning the field and lear learning um, how to conduct these kinds of projects. You know, it's, it's easy to be like, well, there's a significant difference. Trees, <laughs> trees uh, are doing terrible, but really, you know, they're very comparable. And, you know, sometimes what is significant in science might not signif be significant in a practical sense, especially when I'm making recommendations to the city. So that being said, um, we also looked more closely at our species of interest and we actually found 
that when we looked more closely, um, it was really only red oak that had um, a significant difference between the, the two treatments. Um, so, and this was kind of like across the board. Um, so, yeah, so let's see. So again, it's kind of important to really think about what this means in a practical sense. Um, you know, it was significant. We do see that, um, that the, the red oak is smaller on study properties than in comparison properties. Um, and technically it's doing worse. Um, if we found that this was like something that really warranted concern, for example, you know, we could, I could suggest to the city that maybe red oak should have extra protections um, to just make sure that, you know, the critical root zone is more left intact, um, maybe moving down the DBH classification so that it becomes a heritage uh, species more, more quickly. Um, but in the end, we didn't, we didn't find that this was too much of a concern. Um, so we didn't necessarily make the recommendations. We kind of, you know, put them out there, um, but nothing has changed in the ordinance so far. So, um, and then going on to soil compaction. So soil compaction, again, really came up in the literature as something that was important. Um, what was interesting is perhaps counterintuitively, we found that soil compaction was higher um, around the trees on properties that were not recently redeveloped. And again, while we found that this was statistically significant, average soil compaction levels didn't surpass 300 PSI, which is the accepted level for healthy root growth, which you see here with, with the blue line. And this may explain why trees on non-redeveloped sites were still in overall condition or good condition, um, regardless um, of their relative uh, compacted soil levels. But what was interesting was that we found no difference between soil, um, between the soil for trees that were removed versus those that were preserved. So this suggests that uh, compaction did not play a role in tree mortality. And then, um, Another thing we really wanted to look at is the tree protection zone. So are they effectively protecting the critical root zone? One of the questions that we had, you know, of course, was are, are the tree protection zones doing their job? Um, and statistical tests found that soil compaction was significantly higher. Um, again, not that much higher, but, but we'll, we'll take it. Um, and that the building activity areas were um, they were more compacted, the areas where trees, the soils surrounding trees, then critical root zone was less compacted. And both were not, they both or neither surpassed 300 PSI. So all in all doing a great job, not compacting the soil either within the tree preservation areas or in the air, even the areas where, where building activity occurred. Um, so that was definitely successful for the city to see. And then finally, just two models that we ran. Um, so first we were just want to see, can we predict tree condition after construction occurs and kind of like use a model to predict condition. So again, we use the variables of treatment, DBH proximity and level of soil compaction. We threw it in, um, threw it in a model. Um, now I'm trying to generalize linear model uh, with a gamma fit. And so, and we just kind of saw what the significant explanatory variables were. For all trees, we found that actually street was like a significant explanatory variable for a tree condition, which was interesting. And we looked into it further and it's actually like some, some species did better closer to the street, some species did better worse. So it actually wasn't, there wasn't really a consensus. And then when we were looking closer at the species, there, was, there also wasn't a lot of consensus um, across the board. So um, when I looked at this again, I kind of at first struggled at like, what does this all mean? But, um, you know, looking at this through the lens of the project itself, we were evaluating trees that were intended to be preserved um, through a tree preservation ordinance. So that's different than analyzing trees that were intentionally not protected during construction. So therefore, I think the fact that we were not able to predict tree condition based on construction disturbance kind of makes sense since construction disturbance was kind of intentionally reduced. Um, and it's also worth noting that proximity to house foundation was overall not a significant variable 
at all in tree condition, except for her Leslie or her slightly less tolerant red oak. Um, but actually, I'll have to relook. I forget if they did better closer to the foundation or not. So, um, and then our last thing that we ran was whether or not we could predict tree mortality after construction. So. Um, we actually found that trunk diameter was the only significant variable for tree mortality on redeveloped properties. And we used a logistic regression and found that um, trees are actually 1% more likely to remain after construction occurred for every one inch increase in their trunk diameter. Um, so again, it's you know only 1% chance, but taking it through the lens of, of what the project is and what we were trying to figure out this was really great news for a tree preservation ordinance because um, it provides evidence that larger trees are actually being successfully preserved. Um, so even that 1%, that's better than them doing worse because the literature had said that that trees generally do worse after construction, large trees. Okay, so what conclusions did I make from my data? Um, what does this tell us about the efficacy of tree preservation ordinances? This table I will um, go through. Um, it compares what the literature says about trees on construction sites without a preservation ordinance in place versus what my evaluation of the city's tree preservation ordinance found. So first, uh, the city's tree preservation ordinance helps protect mature trees, like I had just uh, talked about. So in the literature, as I said, found that when trees were not protected by a preservation ordinance, large mature trees were more likely to be removed after construction occurred. However, as we discussed, my model for tree mortality predicted that trees were more likely to remain as trunk diameter increased. And second, the city's tree preservation ordinance preserved trees regardless of proximity to hardscape. Our study found no correlation between proximity to foundation and either tree condition or mortality. These findings contrast with other studies that found that trees close to newly redeveloped buildings without preservation protections in place were more likely to be removed. And then lastly, tree preservation ordinances protect the critical root zone from soil compaction. As properties that recently underwent construction um, on properties, uh, soil compaction levels did not exceed the literature-based threshold for restric restricted root growth and were actually less compacted than properties that had not experienced construction over the past 50 years. Furthermore, this assessment found that for recently redeveloped homes, building activity areas where construction activities were unrestricted had soils that were significantly more compacted when compared to the soils within the critical root zones of protected trees. So again, the aim of this study to better understand the condition survival outcomes of residential trees intended to be preserved through municipal tree preservation ordinance. And the results um, we found, they indicate that the city's ordinance is successful in preserving trees during and after construction occurs. This is as evident again through the um, overall like pretty good preservation rate, nearly 75%, um, the tree condition ratings that are comparable to trees that had not experienced recent construction finding no correlation between proximity to newly developed foundation and observed tree condition or mortality, and the discovery of healthy soil compaction levels within the tree protection areas and the critical root zones of preserved trees. So these findings um, align with recent studies that consider the outcomes of tree ordinances on tree health. Um, one of these authors, Deb Hilbert, she was actually the guest speaker at this forum last month. Okay, so um, before I finish speaking, I just wanted to take some time to talk about my lessons learned, recommendations, and areas to explore for future research. So, of course, my first recommendation for municipalities is to work on creating an urban forestry management plan and to begin introducing ordinances that protect trees on public and private property. So hopefully this study provides some evidence to how tree preservation ordinances can be successful in protecting trees during and after construction occurs. Um, there was another really great presentation on this forum in September that discussed how to develop and implement tree ordinances. So I definitely highly suggest um, starting there if you haven't already done so. And the next steps would be to begin to assess the effectiveness of these types of ordinances and their programs. Um, as they say, you can't ma manage what you don't measure. 
Um, it's also important to retain data in a way that can be used more easily in the future. As I discussed earlier in the case of Highland Park, while permits and tree preservation plans were required, not all of the required documents were saved in their entirety, or they were kind of like tucked away in a physical case file. And this made doing that preliminary data collection a lot more difficult. Um, I forget how long in total, I think I kind of was designing this research project, you know, like half a year or something. There was a lot of work that went into it beforehand. Um, so having this type of data already digitized um, will save time and a lot of headache down the line, even if you're just doing it, you know, for the sake of the, the city and not doing it for research. But what's really cool is that as a direct result of this study, Highland Park has already begun to kind of implement new practices. Um, they're retaining complete tree preservation documents and digitally scanning them um, right away um, and saving them on their city database. So another really big takeaway too is the importance of collaborative projects like this. I think that taking advantage of collaborations across sectors is so important in urban forestry. You know, hiring a student researcher to evaluate programs and ordinances can be a really cost effective way to better understand the implications and decisions surrounding urban forestry management. And it's just a really good way to kind of, you know, connect um, different people across different disciplines and different um, sectors, um, especially for, for young students and, and people looking to get into the, the field of urban forestry. And so finally, um, areas for future research. So as you all know, trees on private properties are complicated to study. There are so many factors that go into their successful establishment or ultimately can lead to their death. And it can be impossible to capture all of this in one study. So one of the ways I hope to understand them a bit more is by surveying homeowners and home developers on their knowledge, perceptions, and practices regarding trees on residential properties. And so I'm actually doing this as a follow-up to this study. Um, I was able last year to send out surveys to homeowners and developers. Um, so the homeowners of this study and the developers who worked on these homes. And currently we're working through data analysis, we're beginning to write. So I'm really interested in just, you know, seeing the results, writing, thinking about it, um, connecting it to this research. Um, and then some more next research, uh, just thinking about like urban forest governance capacity or kind of the ability that community has to, to manage the urban forest. As I mentioned, this research took place in a very affluent community. It has plenty of resources and social capital to kind of fund a robust urban forestry department and kind of like enact these ordinances and, you know, have tree councils and like be really engaged in this kind of thing. So similarly, community buy-in, um, which I, you know, I envision as a component of urban forest governance and how does, how does community support for and participation in urban forest programs and policy kind of strengthen this capacity? So both of these uh, concepts I'm really interested in and I plan to explore in my PhD research. And then, so if you'd like um, just more details about the methods, uh, more thorough discussion of the results, um, or just you know to kind of learn more about the topic of tree preservation ordinances, um, you can find all this information on the published version of this research. And feel free to email me um, if you need a copy. Okay, so um, that is it from me. So um, definitely let me know if you have any questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, and yeah, and I also was thinking too, if you all would like, um, you know, I would love to kind of hear from you all and, and kind of hear maybe like what city you're from, um, does your community have a tree preservation ordinance? You know, do you have any experience working with trees on construction sites either through working through having your own trees um, on a property that you were renovating um, or just anything else you'd like to share. So beyond questions, feel free to just share your experiences. And that's it. And feel free to email me as well if, if anything comes up. Thank you very much, uh, Caitlin. That was uh, a lot of great information. If For those looking at the um, chat throughout, Ryan and I have posted a few of the links for the videos for the werewolf form videos are being posted and, and updated as well as a link to oh, nice. uh, Caitlin's published research. So that's in there. Um, cool. Thank you. Be happy uh, 
to check those out so that you can take any of those resources. There was a question that came up um, during, while you were speaking, Caitlin, so I'll, I'll just read it out to you so you don't have to try to find it. Um, this comes from Jeff. He was wondering if efforts were made to protect the critical root zone of trees on adjacent properties, if those critical root zones uh, encroached on the site being built on. Yep, yeah, they did. Um, a lot of times, um, all the trees on the other properties were also included in the in the site maps. Um, so that's a great question. So we we um, we included them in the preservation rate, um, but generally didn't measure them just because they were on a different property that we weren't allowed or we, we didn't notify beforehand. Um, but we did include them in the preservation rate. So. Excellent. Um, I just want to point out that Ryan Murphy has posted the, the link that you can go to to report if you are interested in getting ISA CEUs for attending today's session. So make sure you check that out. It's in the chat window. Cool. Um, are there any other questions? We just have a few minutes left. So if anybody wanted to respond or share something from one of Caitlin's questions, that would be great. Or if there are any other questions, uh, I'd be happy to, you can either just turn your, your uh, mic on if you want or put it in the chat and I'm, I'm happy to yeah, facilitate it's, that. Yeah, it's funny. As I said, I when I ran through this yesterday, I was like, oh, it's only 35 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna have so much time. And then it ends up, so yeah, definitely. Um, you know, if, if something comes up and we don't have time to talk about it here, um, I'd love uh, to chat during, through email. Like I said, even just your experiences um, with tree preservation or tree ordinances, so. That's great. I'll just note that Caitlin posted her uh, email address um, in the yep, chat yeah. as well. Yeah, and, and then for the recording, it's um, it's kpike at mail.ubc.ca, or you can email me at my Gmail. It's just caitlinpike at gmail.com. All right, Louise, it looks like she uh, is unmuted to ask a question. So please go ahead, Louise. Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> Thanks, Eric. Can you hear me, Caitlin? Yep. Awesome. Um, I, I, uh, came in a little bit late because I was at another meeting. Um, so if you answer this question, uh, my apologies, and I hope I'm going to articulate it well enough. Um, no. did, your, did you actually look at um, also how fully the tree preservation, preservation ordinance was followed um, or um, whether there were, shall we say, infractions or some yeah. things like that? So that's something I was definitely interested in. Um, I wasn't sure if I had enough like kind of verifiable data and it wasn't something that I ended up exploring, but I, 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 yeah, I always kind of try to stop myself from being like too interested in too many things, but that was something I was, I was also really interested in. And I think would be a cool follow-up as well. Um, because like you said, that could play a big role. Um, I think I like to I like to think from my understanding that there's not a lot of infractions that occur and that those are kind of just like special special uh, circumstances. But yeah, you're right. Um, that's definitely some, a really interesting angle to consider. All right. Well, to to be respectful of everybody's time and other Zoom meetings you might have to attend, we're at eleven. So I want to thank our speaker Caitlin again very much for taking the time, especially getting up earlier. Uh, to, to join us today. And um, thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.